Let me check. So, hey guys, welcome. Um, I'm joined today by a, a very special guest that I'm really excited about actually. So, um, Fan Shen. Fan Shen with the amazing name. Uh, Fan Shen is an award winning actor, producer, educator, all sorts of things. I met Fan Shen um, a few years back when I was running a little film festival in Birmingham. And she was touring her one woman show, One Drop of Love, which is amazing. Um, she's also a producer and development exec who worked with some of Hollywood's finest. Um, and she's a co-host of the podcast Sister Brunt, which yeah. I'm dying to hear all about. Um, <laughs> you know, an immense background, served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Cape Verde, West Africa, amongst other things. Um, and also was involved in the, um, the Inclusion Rider, which was announced at the 2018 Oscar Awards. So welcome, Fanchen. Oh, thank you so much. It's wonderful to see you again. I mean, <laughs> close to in person as we can get right now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so what I wanted to cover really here was just kind of starting oh, way at the shoot. beginning. Now now. You're okay, you were oh. frozen a second. Uh -oh. Uh oh, I'm back. Okay. You're so, back. I mean, yeah. I, I, I know a lot of your story, obviously, from the film um, One Drop of Love. And if people want to watch that to kind of understand your whole sort of backstory, where can they go to watch that? Oh, we don't quite have the film online yet, um, yeah. but they can, if they kind of, if they sign up for our newsletter on the website, which is onedropoflove.org, they'll get a, an email when we do put it up. So mm -hmm. it's in the works. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So, um, so really quickly, let's just go back a little bit to the beginning in terms of, you know, when you, I know that you're kind of like in film and education in that space, but when you were younger, like really younger, what, what did you want to be in life? What, what were the kind of things that went through your head? Uh, I, I knew I wanted to be an actor when I, since I was, uh, I was in my uh, bilingual second grade class production of the <laughs> Cracker. <laughs> wow. I was on stage and I thought, yes, this is amazing. This is a great feeling. And and I really um through the years knew that what most attracted to me, me to it was this the ability to tell stories. So I'm very fortunate that I knew pretty early on that I would be a storyteller in some way or another. So that's kind yeah. of how that's that's amazing to have known that early and then and then to have been able to kind of live out that dream is pretty special yeah i'm really lucky i did i wasn't really surrounded by people who knew it wasn't like i you know grew up in anywhere near the industry or anything but i just knew that i wanted to pursue that and and then I came full circle and ended up also now with my job being able to help other people tell stories so it mm -hmm. truly is i have to say i'm really really like to have found you know found what i want to do with my whole life yeah perfect and i guess and in terms of acting in the film industry you know we both know that in terms of um you know what you see kind of like representation in front of and behind the camera you know you don't often see you know people of color women disabilities you know kind of all of that kind of thing so so can you pinpoint what it was that kind of gave you the courage to still want to step into that sort of world i think um it was so for me and i'm so glad for this topic because i think it's so great about kind of like busting these stereotypes um and and at the same time embracing the pieces them of them that make us who we are if they mean we're part of a culture or part of a system or um so I moved out to Hollywood in 2001 because I had been in New York. I was teaching uh, ESL and also still pursuing mostly theater acting. And I decided to come and pursue film and TV in Los Angeles. And I immediately was confronted with, um, well, you know, did your agent send you out for the black role or the white role? And then I'd have to think about how I was going to wear my hair, how I was going to speak, how I was going to dress. and I just thought this is insane. This is, you know, this is how limited this industry is and the casting directors are and the producers are that um, my experience and therefore so many other people's experiences mm. don't fit their boxes. So that's when I, that I, when I coming up against that challenge mm. pushed me to eventually 
write a show about what it means to be in these, you know, people use words like liminal spaces or um, busting stereotypes of who you, how you're supposed to dress and act. And, um, mm -hmm. and so that's how I ended up writing the show. And that really helped me, you know, kind of evolve as a, as a human being, I think, and then hopefully help others evolve by seeing it and saying, be free to be who you are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was, that kind of leads on really nicely to my next question was, which was, you know, how can people that are on the margins, you know, that don't see themselves reflected back, how can they get into film? You know, how do they get into the industry? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't stress this enough and it's three easy words to remember. Tell your story, <laughs> tell yeah. your story. It matters just even within your family or your intimate relationships to speak truth about who you are and your feelings and your experiences. Um, but also I have to say that in the industry is, is more and more embracing people's truths, um, their, their authentic selves in the best of ways. I think <clears throat> we're seeing a lot of that right now with celebrities who have tried to kind of be relatable right now and mm -hmm. people aren't having it. And because we're like, we want authenticity. And that's why yeah. you get YouTube stars and other influencers who haven't, don't have money or don't, you know, don't have the resources celebrities have, but it's because they're so authentic. So yeah. tell your story. That's, that's the beginning always yeah. to end up eventually in a career, you know, that you, that where you can tell it to lots and lots of people. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, what can, you know, I know that you sort of said that we are sort of seeing some improvements within the film industry, but what more can the film industry do to encourage more, more diversity, more, you know, a broader range of stories? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, you got me on my soapbox here. So number Good. one, <laughs> industry has to stop equating whiteness with human, with human being as though white is just human and then everything else is other right so mm -hmm. you have black panther not the panther of course it's named after a comic book right but the fact that or crazy rich asians right so when yeah. when people of color or marginalized people are in films or stories it's very specifically about that culture or that ethnicity versus white people, we don't say, well, Game of Thrones was about, about a bunch of white people, but it was, right? And if we, we have to both recognize that we've been doing that since the beginning of the film industry and yeah. that we have to change it so that you both get authentic stories. So Black Panther should be there, Crazy Rich Asians should be there, and it can be about those specific experiences. But also we need to see Black people, Indigenous people, uh, Latinx represented in stories that are just about people, because we're also yeah. just people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then that kind of leads me on to um, one of the things that I've been sort of mulling over. So, you know, I was doing the film festival a couple of years back. Um, do, you, do, you, do you think we still need things like, you know, platforms like Black film festivals or, you know, film festivals for female directors? Do we still need that or has the industry moved? further enough no the industry yeah. has not moved anywhere near far enough for us to okay. not those and like i said here's the thing and this this is hard for some powerful white people to hear mm -hmm. we should get to have both right we should get to have the film festivals that are dedicated to blackness right representation of blackness representation of lgbtq representation mm -hmm. of disability and we should also appear in stories where that's not the main thing. Might be part of the character, but it's not mm -hmm. the main part because they're human and they're yeah. being something different. What white people, the reason they have a hard time with that is that they say, well, then why can't we have a white people festival? And I'm like, honey, do you know your history? Because I don't think y'all want to be celebrating. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think that you want to celebrate that, you could have to dig deep and understand what are the roots of how you became white in the first place. And trust me, that's not going to be, you know, we have reasons to have yeah. to have our festivals. Yours are all negative. Yours are all, you know, built around the concept of 
you know, supremacy. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so we yeah. have to, we have to, have, we, we have to, and we should have both. Yeah. Yeah. And then what do you say, you know, one of the, one of the motivations for starting these conversations was, so I was at an event um, in December where people were talking about, you know, getting on in education and that kind of thing. And there was a, it was at a university. So a lot of young students and a, a lot of young black students, and they were talking about the challenges of not having role models. And they were saying, you know, almost like it's difficult for us because we don't have any role models. So, so what do you say to you know kind of like young black kids or you know, you know young kids of color when they don't see themselves represented how can they still push through you know mm -hmm. as well as you know the activists kind of trying to kind of get that change but what do you say to them in terms of mindset for kind of pushing through those stereotypes yeah i say two things one is listen to the sister brunch podcast i'm sorry to plug <laughs> it but, but it is literally this is why we do the podcast is that we, the hosts of the podcast and the producers of the podcast, Anya mm -hmm. Adams, Cristobal and Siabwadi, uh, and Brittany Turner, we didn't have this. When, you know, we didn't have these role models. We are working to provide these role mm -hmm. models so that young girls can listen and say, I had no idea what a film loader was, and now I've heard it, and you know, maybe that's something I could be, or mm -hmm. I don't know what, I didn't even know there was such thing as a development executive. Now I know, and I could work yeah. towards that. So number one is there, there are resources out there. Um, mm -hmm. Listen to the resources that, that are there, and Sister Brunch is one of those. The second is to create your own way of sharing. And I've found that that has been a big part of how I've been successful with my show and successful in the industry was that I started by paying it forward by supporting mm -hmm. other people. And I still continue yeah. to, but like finding what do people need? What kind of support do they need showing up for them? And then eventually when it's your time, they'll, they'll yeah. come back to you. So you can find people uh, to have as role models. We're out there. Get on Twitter, you know, follow film Twitter, follow women filmmakers. You know, there are lots of yeah. people to follow and even interact with. Yeah. So find, find the role models or be the first, you know, be your own role, <laughs> role model. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. 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 Cool. I want to get on to, um, so tell me a bit more about Sister Brunch. What was the inspiration for, how did that all get started and what, what kind of topics do you cover? Yeah, uh, so when I, let's see, I met Anya Adams, who's the co-host, mm -hmm. and, and it was so great because at the time I met her, she was assistant directing on Blackish, on the show Blackish. Okay, yeah. And, uh, but she also was just about to direct and produce her her first short film ever and she invited me to a sister brunch and a sister brunch was that um some trainees in the directors guild of america training mm -hmm. program started to notice the the mentors of the program started to notice that there that the women of color needed a little extra something outside of the training. And so the mm -hmm. mentors started invite, had like inviting these women out to a casual brunch. Mm -hmm. That grew and Anya started hosting the brunches in her backyard. So they'd happen every month or so and or every two months and we'd you know, get together. So she invited me to one and I was just coming off of the inclusion writer, pushing people to use it and getting this mm -hmm. constant excuse there aren't enough people to hire. Why are you making us do this? We can't find the people to hire. Yeah. And I sit at Sister Brunch and it's packed <laughs> with the women mm -hmm. in all these different positions. And I'm like, they're all right here. And each mm -hmm. one of them had friends that they also know. So Anya and I said, let's do a podcast so that people can meet these women and they can never use that tired excuse again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, very tired. <laughs> very tired excuses. Yeah. Um, so let's let's get into um, one of the things that um, that has been a common theme of the people that I've spoken to is, is things like having very strong, um, you know, whether it be kind of like self discipline or morning routines or productivity, etc. Are you into that kind of thing, like morning routines? What does that look like for you? 
<laughs> not in the last couple months. It's been a little <laughs> yeah. It's funny you said that. I I just I think within the the week I just started getting back into physical routine. Yeah. I got bike tuned up and have just been kind of taking longer walks and yeah. trying to take care of myself physically. There is one thing that I do use without fail to uh, to help me focus when I'm working, and it's called Focus Keeper, and it's an app for your phone. Um, there are it's based on this scientific theory called the Pomodoro method, which is that you work for 25 minutes and then you take a five minute break. You work for 25 minutes, take a five minute break. So working wise, productivity wise, I really like that for the, especially for the break reminder. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but yeah, otherwise, and I've been trying to meditate. I, I do that, you know, not quite cons mm -hmm. as consistently as I'd like to, but I do find that my day is always better when I do. So yeah. yeah couple things what about you do i get questions yeah you can. <laughs> yeah my so at the moment so in lockdown so at the moment i'm in lockdown with my daughter i can't remember if you met my daughter at the film festival I did. Um, yes yeah so i'm in lockdown there so we've got a bit of a morning routine so i, I like to do a bit of meditation i don't always remember remember to do everything yeah. so i do a bit of meditation um i then listen to um i'm trying to listen to like quite a positive book you know, so we're doing a book club in a in a few weeks. I'm doing like an online book club. Oh, we're nice. reading you. We're reading You Are a Badass by Jen Sincero. I don't know it really. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, <laughs> she's a, she's a New Yorker as well. So we're reading um, You Are a Badass, and then um, and then what? Do, then I do a bit of journaling, and then we either go out for a run or we go out for a walk. So that's kind of my you know we do that pretty much every day. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I wasn't as disciplined before the lockdown, but I kind of felt like I had to, you know, I had to kind of get a grip almost. Yeah, yeah. wanted to get some control over something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had I had a good month and a half where I had zero control whatsoever, ate <laughs> anything in front of me and kept eating it and kept drinking. And, and uh, yeah, I just recently thought, I did that. I'm glad I, I needed yeah. to do it go through that because I'm not one to shame anybody for doing what they need to do as long as they you know what I think it's I, I have a certain number that when I step on the scale or can't fit into certain things that I'm like yeah. oh okay. yeah <laughs> so. yeah bring it back rein it back in uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> um and then in terms of are you a, are you a book person are you into books are you into reading uh -huh. I am. I tend to read more nonfiction. I'm, I okay. really like to kind of like highlight and take yeah. notes and type out the notes and things. So yeah, I'm definitely more yeah. of a non. Yeah. Okay. So what's your, what's your favorite book or the book that has had the biggest impact on you? Oh, wow. Oh, uh, of like of all time. Oh, Ooh. Um, so yeah, uh, certainly, uh, of all time, um, the, uh, the book that put me on my path to writing One Drop, which is called Fatal Invention, and the mm -hmm. author is Dorothy Roberts, and she breaks down the construction of race in the United States, and, um, and th that's just the first chapter. And then the, the following chapters really dig into how our belief in race Mm -hmm. has now uh, contributed, for example, to the health crisis among African Americans, mm -hmm. because we, because doctors are telling us that we have certain prevalent, you know, a prevalence of diseases because we're black mm -hmm. versus reality, which is it's because we face racism. It's not because we're black, it's mm -hmm. because we face racism. And it really opened my eyes to um the damage of that initial construction of race but then also yeah. thinking about the solution is not to then say well race doesn't matter because it's so ingrained in us that it mm. does and it can yeah. have some positive now but it, it but to examine the ways that racism and work towards dismantling racism in all the ways that it negatively affects everybody so mm -hmm. it's certainly probably the most powerful book I've read. Yeah. 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 I, I guess it's probably, it's probably, would you say it's kind of shaped a lot of what you've done kind of and influenced you in terms of where you've gone? Yeah. 
In fact, I mean, I think that's back to your point around stereotypes. Um, it helped me because at the time when I first started developing One Drop, there were, I had a hyper focus on mixed identity because my mom yeah. is white American. Um, she's also Cherokee, Blackfeet, mm -hmm. and her and Danish is her kind of white roots. And my dad is Jamaican and immigrated mm -hmm. to the U.S. in the 50, late 50s. Um, but his family is also, we've been told, has like Irish, um, you know, okay. near, nearby and near generations. So I think um, I started off really just thinking about being mixed and what that meant. And as I read that book, I started to think there's this bigger context, this bigger mm -hmm. picture, just those M me calling myself biracial even mm -hmm. the word bi presumes that race is real right yeah. it presumes if i'm going to say biracial means like oh i definitely have a black mom and a or black dad and a white mom whereas yeah those things are right and so it really helped me shift the focus of the play from it's so hard to be mixed into look how this entire system has fucked us all over yeah 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 now, do to change it so. <laughs> yeah and it's fascinating i know some of the like the old conversation that we've had say like on facebook or something and it's really interesting i'm starting to i think understand a little bit more about where the u.s is in terms of race and racism and i think the uk is in a slightly different, different place mm -hmm. um, yeah, and going on almost like a different journey yeah yeah right it's yeah, I mean, historically, of course, we got our notion of race from Europe, right? Yeah. Like that's, yeah. it, it was imported, but but we were, you know, quote, we, the large we, you know, white, white, the white we were much yeah. more brutal and, and I think much more sustaining, although I think it's sustained in Europe differently. Um, yeah. But, I think that's right. I mean, there is, and obviously with things like Brexit and all of that, there have been some changes, but the way that somebody summed it up um, the other day we were talking, they kind of said, you know, in the US, um, it, it certainly from, from where we see it across the pond, it looks as though it's still fairly overt, to be honest, the racism, whereas in the UK, the racism is definitely here, but it's more covert. Right, you know, because it's in, impolite to be racist. <laughs> exactly. And, and we wait. <laughs> between which would we prefer right yeah. it's <laughs> honestly yeah yeah it's, uh, it's I challenging that i can so that we can point it out and and i, I don't yeah. know if you saw yesterday the the man that was uh what bird watching in in uh, central park in new york and this mm. white woman was walking her dog off a leash and so the man asked her to put the leash on she ends up calling the police on the man as a black man watching birds and you know telling the police that he's threatening her life meanwhile she's holding it on to her dog and her dog is choking itself and she's calling the police so the good news about the covert piece of it and that the thing is that in and of itself could be covert because she can come up with all excuses about why she yeah. felt but but it ma we know fortunately that it matters now that if we get it on video and we share mm. that video that that matters and so that's where that covert piece comes in handy because you can mm. point to it and then yeah. you can the person and shame anybody who you know is but it's uh it's tough because then other days you just want to get through your day and sometimes yeah. you're like just the covert version so I can get through my yeah. day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we we pretty much we're well we're we're out of time. I'm tired. Uh -oh. totally tired now. Uh, um and then I guess I, I almost feel oh my gosh I'm gonna, I'm gonna literally say forgive my pit like I really <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? The, you know the one thing I'm the one thing yeah. I'm looking for I'm looking for I'm cutting my hair so I'm going so I'm going natural. Yes. I can't wait. To, I can't wait to cut this. Honestly, it's killing me. It's, it's gorgeous. I actually, I was going to ask you, how are you maintaining such a beautiful haircut right now? 
to be fair, so all credit to my hairdresser. So he, he generally does a very good haircut. So bear in mind, yeah. this now hasn't been cut for about 13 weeks. So he's well, a good hairdresser. He's good. <laughs> <laughs> Mine was lasting, mine lasted for a little bit, but it's, it's starting to get that, you know, this part. Ooh, I'd give anything yeah. to show. <laughs> I know, I know. So yeah, so I'm still, so I'm still, yeah, I'm, I'm going that. Gonna... I, yeah, I decided that I needed to, to kind of, you know, get rid of these, um, these Western symbolisms of beauty. <laughs> I decided it was time. I, mean, I, I think that's so interesting. It, yeah. Hair is a whole category in and of itself. Mm tough because I it's similar to and I'm sorry to use such an American reference here but like thinking about Joe Biden and not wanting to have to vote for him but having to vote for him and so I don't know if you follow recently he said if you don't vote for me you ain't black and he literally said no. you ain't black yes so we don't want to vote for him but we have to, right? That it, in, a, in our time period, we have to. Then we can make a fuss so that your daughter and my nieces and nephews, so that they don't have to make that choice. But yeah. the, so I, and I equate that with hair because I am not judgmental of my sisters who wear their hair straight because we know why we know why we do it but i'm also like i understand i i i don't walk in their world and in their shoes and if it feels like a necessary survival method or it makes you feel good about yourself that's where we are right now let's not pass that on to our babies that's my big thing is like let's tell our babies not to do it because what they whatever comes out of their head is gorgeous and beautiful <laughs> exactly exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely yeah. okay i think we're, we're out of time we're out of thank time. you so much no thank you so much that was that yeah. was amazing it's been lovely to talk to you great to talk to you yeah stay cool. in touch or we'll see each other online and yeah other. hopefully yeah, yeah. And, maybe, and maybe in the flesh again sometime I would love that so much. Yeah. Maybe when I start doing the film festival again, we'll see. Yeah. Are you going to tour with your book at all? Um, I mean, I'm now, who no, knows? I mean, right. Yeah, interesting. I mean, I did the first, I did the first like sort of live book event, like a Q&A, literally just before lockdown. And then obviously, you know, <laughs> it's kind of just all the stuff. So, yeah. 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 Okay. So I'm kind of having, you know, I'm partly, part of the reason for having these conversations is just, because obviously you start thinking about the next book and the next book. So I'm, this is kind of like research and, you know, just keeping the, the juices going. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Well, great so to it's see been amazing to talk to you, Fanchen. For continuing to do this work. No, so you're welcome. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you so much. Have a great day. Okay, you too. Okay, bye bye. Take care.